Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we observe a festival in the church calendar that's rather recent and new. It's only 500 years old. Reformation Day. On October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, which was a bulletin board of sorts. And in these theses, he protested the Roman Catholic sale of indulgences, thus starting the Reformation. What followed was a near constant rush of events that had cataclysmic changes for church and society. And the fires that were started then are still burning to this day. And the controversies and the changes, and so forth. Now, it would be easy enough to consider the Reformation by focusing on the man Martin Luther. He was a fascinating, gifted, courageous individual. It would also be easy enough to consider the Reformation from the standpoint of history and politics. You would be surprised how much Luther's work affected society all over Europe, and even in America, too, since Columbus had just discovered America prior to the Reformation. But we Lutherans, we genuine Lutherans who hold to the Book of Concord are not into hero worship. Luther was a fallible human being. And as much as we might enjoy history, we do not uh, observe Reformation Day for the sake of history itself. So what do we observe Reformation Day for? Why do we do it? We observe it because we are committed to the truth of God's word and we believe what we believe because God has said so in the Bible. And so we Lutherans observe Reformation Day because of the biblical truth that Luther and his friends brought to light that can be summarized in the three great Reformation solas. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. And in English these are translated grace alone, Faith alone, scripture alone. And our epistle text this morning is a great text to teach these Reformation solas, especially the first two, grace alone and faith alone. And this shouldn't surprise us that these Reformation solas are taught in the book of Romans. Luther loved the book of Romans and was greatly influenced by it. He even said of it that it is the chief part of the New Testament and is truly the purest gospel. He also went on to say that all Christians should memorize it, the whole book. You could say that the book of Romans and the Reformation solas that are taught in it is what sent the Roman Catholic Church reeling and created the Lutheran Church. And the fire still burns, as I said. And by the way, I argue, as C.F.W. Walther did, the creator or the uh, uh, one of the first leaders in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that the Lutheran Church is the correct church because it preaches the pure gospel in all its articles. It's the only church that does so. And so we can be thankful for the Reformation, for the creation of the Lutheran Church. All right, let's pay attention as we get into the details of our Romans 3 text and as we acquaint ourselves again with the three solas of the Reformation. The epistle text serves as the sermon text for today. So here again are the first two verses. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. These verses set the foundation of the three great solas, and this is how it works. Here we learn the law, summarized by God's holy Ten Commandments, cannot make us holy or justified in God's sight. It is useless to attempt to use the law and the commandments to make yourself good and acceptable to God. You are too corrupt. We all are. So what is the purpose of the law if it is not to make us holy? Well, God did give the law 
to show us the way of holiness, holiness and how one might live righteously before him, but the sad fact is we are so very sinful and unable to do it. This is one of the great corollaries of Reformation teaching by Luther. The law commands the impossible. Then Ten Commandments command us to do things that we are just unable to do. And so it is that the law's great purpose is to reveal sin and condemn us. It shows how we ought to have lived and how we haven't lived it. And it's purpose is served to this day when through the faithful preaching of the law you become aware of how great and miserable of a sinner you are and that God alone in his grace is needed to save you. And this is necessary to grasp to become a Christian. That the law cannot save and only God in his grace can. And the Roman church errs horribly to this day by mishandling the law, using it as a means of becoming good and justified before God. Now, don't misunderstand me. The law is still something good. The Ten Commandments are still good. And it's good because it prepares us to believe with confidence that only God in his grace can save us. But the law itself doesn't make us good. Only God in his grace can. Now, perhaps you struggle to be good and make yourself justified before God through your efforts and your works and obedience to the law. I know you do because it's in all of us. Luther struggled mightily to be good and justified through the law. Like Paul, you could say he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He considered all the commandments and did everything he was told that would make him acceptable and earn God's favor. He became a monk which was a way to get your foot in the door of heaven. He studied, he prayed for hours on end. He would fast for days upon days. He would purposely sleep in the cold and whip himself so that he might subdue his sinful flesh, which, by the way, is a good thing. But he did all these things to become justified before God, to make himself acceptable to God. But the more he tried to rid himself of sin and become justified and holy before God, the more miserable and sinful he felt. Have you ever, have you ever felt that? The more I try to be a good Christian, the more sinful I seem to be. And it was a text like this epistle text in Romans chapter 3 where Luther realized finally that we are not saved we're not made good. We're not justified before God by our works and obedience to the law. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and through Scripture alone. And this relieves us of great pressure. This lifts the great weight off our shoulders that we have to save ourselves. Only God can save us. Let's consider in a little bit more detail, this first alone, the first sola, grace alone, it's clearly taught in our epistle text in verses 23 and 24, and if you still have your orange sheet, you can look at it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There we have it. We are justified by God's grace as a gift. Therefore, salvation, redemption, justification before God is not something earned or gained by our wisdom, by our works, by our intellect, or anything else that we think we can offer to God. Salvation is by God's grace alone, as a gift, sola gratia. Now notice that in this text there are no qualifications to this grace of God either. Scripture does not speak of some kind of infused or partial grace that gets us started on the road of salvation and we have to do the rest. The Roman church to this day teaches that baptism only saves you from your original sin. Any sins that you commit in this life, well, you've got to kind of work those off. 
If you didn't do such a good job of working those off in this life, then, well, you got purgatory to work them off. And so it was that people in Luther's day were really interested in indulgences because you got time off out of purgatory. And Luther said, what's going on? This isn't biblical teaching. Friends, we are justified and made right before God. We're redeemed from our sins. We're made holy and good through God's grace alone, apart from our works. Now, there's two great word pictures that Scripture uses to teach us that we are saved by God's grace alone and not through our efforts. Human birth and resurrection of the dead. And Jesus used this image of human birth to teach us sola gratia, grace alone, in John chapter 3. Here he said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he was speaking to Nicodemus when he said this. And when he, Nicodemus heard Jesus say, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, he stammered, well, how can, how can you be born again? Jesus made it clear later on in the text, it's by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can do. And so we're taught in John 3 that we are saved and brought into God's kingdom by no work of ours, but by the work of the Holy Spirit, just as a baby does not come into existence through the work of its own, but through the work of his parents or her parents. So St. Paul uses this image of a conception and the creation of a baby to teach us, look, it's not your work to bring you to this new birth into God's kingdom. It's a work by somebody outside of you. In this case, the Holy Spirit. He used the image of resurrection of the dead to teach us again the doctrine of grace alone. And he did this clearly in Ephesians chapter 2. There he wrote that we Christians, all of us, were once dead in our trespasses and sins when God made us alive with Christ. Now, how much work does a dead man do to make himself alive? None. That's the point. So it is that sinners who are dead in their sins cannot make themselves alive to God. Resurrection is all God's work. It's all by God's grace because he loves us. We humans flatter ourselves with the false doctrine of free will where we are saved by our choices and decisions to do good and be good. But our text this morning and the rest of Scripture sets the record straight that it is hopeless to try and redeem ourselves by the law. Rather, Scripture teaches us that we are saved by God's grace alone and it is not by our works or our choice. Let's consider that second sola, faith alone. And for this, it's made clear in verses 21 and 22. Here are those verses again. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There you go. God's righteousness, his blessed holiness, his love, his approval, his favor, his sweet attention, his forgiveness, peace with him. It's ours by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Let me explain faith in Jesus Christ for a moment. To believe in Jesus Christ or have faith in him means to have confidence or trust that he is God's son and the appointed savior of mankind who has earned for you and for me righteousness according to the law, something that we could never do. And he was also the propitiation for our sins. He paid the penalty, if you will, for our sins by suffering on the cross innocently. And so faith is an inner quality of the heart and soul. It's not something that you see just by looking at somebody. Faith is passive. It's a, th this is offensive to us, that faith is passive. It doesn't earn God's righteousness and forgiveness. It receives it. Yeah. 
And this, friends, helps us explain why Jesus said things like this, that we must turn and become like children to enter the kingdom of God. And I believe Jesus, when he's explaining faith, turned our attention to children. Why is that? Because children, especially babies, are good at just receiving. And they're very good at just believing what you tell them. Well, God has told us something. In the gospel, Jesus died for your sins. You don't have to earn peace with God. Jesus has done it for you. Believe in him and you are saved. Strangely enough, the Roman church can't answer this question clearly. What must I do to be saved? Scriptures answers it. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This great biblical doctrine of faith alone means that we must set aside the law, the Ten Commandments, our good works or lack thereof when it comes to being justified and made right before God. Our text says as much, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. This means that when you practice these three biblical solas, these three Reformation solas, and you come to a point in your day or a point in your week or a point in your year that you feel the weight of your sin and your lack of good works, which God does expect, then you must train yourself in this great doctrine of faith alone by ignoring the Ten Commandments and their demand for good works and remind yourself that peace with God and the forgiveness of sins has already been won for you by Christ and you simply receive it by faith. Now, when you are joyful again and confident of God's grace and love for you in Christ and that you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, then you can turn your attention to the Ten Commandments and, okay, this is what God wants me to do. As a saved person, as a person saved by Christ, this is how he wants me to live. But being a confident believer in his grace is the only way that you can begin to consider the Ten Commandments properly as just the way God wants you to live and not as a way to earn God's favor and grace. Let's keep going with our text here uh, and the next Reformation Sola Scripture alone. This isn't taught explicitly in our, in our epistle text here in Romans 3, but it is hinted at when Paul wrote that the law and the prophets, that is the Old Testament, bear witness to the righteousness of God and even bear witness to uh, grace alone, faith alone, and Scripture alone. Uh, the Scripture, that is the Bible, and the Bible alone is what reveals God's grace to us in Christ. It's the vehicle through which God extends to us His grace and actually grants us the faith that He wants. Even faith is a gift of God that comes through the Word alone. We looked at this last week when we considered the means of grace. Why are pastors important? Because when pastors preach and teach the scriptures, that is God's word, the Holy Spirit is active to heal and save and forgive and bring joy and make us right before God and comfort us. But where the word of God is not preached or where it is twisted and maligned, the Holy Spirit is shackled, if you will. And this is why Paul could write uh, later on in Romans chapter 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Faith alone, which is so valuable, comes the word of God preached to them. This is uh, good enough for today. Three Reformation souls. There's sometimes more in some lists by Christ alone, to God's glory alone, but uh, these solas really started out with three and then two more were added, and, but three is good enough. 
I hope this convinces you that these three Reformation solas are biblical, that we ought to practice them daily in our life, that we might be comforted with the good news that Jesus has died for our sins. Amen. Amen. Peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.